So this is a quick video where I show you how to undertake a doctoral damage assessment of a representative volume element of a voided steel material. And I'm going to use a boundary condition type called a Dirichlet boundary condition to impose loading on the model. And we're going to look at the stress strain behavior. If you're interested in this sort of videos, then sit back and relax as I will go into this video. All right, so as we get started, we're going to go straight into Abacus and begin to show how you undertake this modeling. So here in Abacus, we just click the path and then I'm going to call this an STL LVE. So it's going to be made of a 2D system. It's going to be deformable and it's going to be made of a shell um, base feature. So we'll continue that. I want this system to have a dimension of 100 by 100 microns. So I'll click on this button, which is the create rectangle. So the coordinate is 0, 0 at the beginning and 100 by 100 at the other end. So that links off with this. And so now we've got the boundary of this RVE. So we need to then distribute the, the voids. And these voids are going to be circular in shape. And they are quite small voids and they are distributed randomly within the structure. So if you know the volume fraction of the voids, you can calculate the actual number of voids that you need based on the diameter, the, the diameter of the circles. So we're just going to randomly do this. So there's nothing very precise about what we're trying to do. So we're just going to distribute the voids across the structure with different diameters, some small, some big, just as you would get in real life. So this is what we have. And then I'll click done. So that becomes our RVE for this voided steel structure. Uh, I've tried to stay away from the boundaries of this RVE just so that I've got clean boundaries. However, if you're interested in the effect of edge boundary uh, voids or structures on a domain then look at this video that i've made where i showed the edge effect associated with this thing and that's not what we're looking at here so now we need to mesh the domain so if we mesh the domain so 7.9 is what it's recommending so we can work with that we can make it a little bit smaller so i'm going to make it mainly quad media axis case and we can then go ahead and look at I'm going to use an explicit model here. It's a plain stress element. And then if we go down here, we want element deletion access activated and then 0.98. So it will be the maximum degradation value. So this is the value at which the element would have experienced a significant reduction in its stiffness due to damage, which means that it can be deleted from the model. So you need to specify these two values if you want to see element deletion during your analysis. And so this is a critical step and you specify this. So we click OK. So now I can then go ahead and mesh the model. So we've meshed the model. Of course, the first thing is to check if. So if I do file mesh and then I look at the quality of the mesh. So it's basically telling me that I've got 1100 nodes and because it's a student license it wouldn't work so i'm going to have to remesh okay so we have a good enough model that captures everything that we need is we're going to create a material so our material is going to be made of steel it's going to be a steel material i'm going to introduce a density for this steel material which is 7860 and the young's modulus the elastic properties of this will be 210 e to power 9 and 0 0.33 the poisson ratio so we're going to then get the plasticity so and i'm going to reference to a value of plasticity that i've used in a video um, on doctor damage which you can see here so if you look at that so basically this is how we want the post yield behavior the plastic behavior of the system to be so it just continues to go in a gradual st strain hardening format so i'm going to get the stress value first and I'm going to paste it here and then I'll go back there and get the strain value and then I'll paste it there as well. So this becomes our stress, plastic stress and plastic strain value. Then the next thing we're going to then do is to look at the doctor damage associated with the system. So I'll just take a moment out of the video just to encourage you that if you haven't subscribed to this channel, this would be a good time to press the subscribe button so that videos like this that I'm making Whenever I release them, you'll be the first to see them. And what I try to do with this channel is to make videos around computational modeling. And my goal, my motto in the channel is to make computational modeling easy, accessible to most viewers, and try and show how you can do things in a very easy and interesting way. I'm a university professor working within a UK university. And so I bring a lot of 
wealth of experience as to the theory behind some what's going on with the videos and I, and, I, and I believe that if you subscribe to the channel and join my community I will not only show you how these things are done in, in the videos but you also understand the theory behind what we are trying to do in this in this video so please if you are interested do subscribe do like the channel do like the video share it among your friends and let's go back to the video so the other thing that we then need to do here is to sort of consider what the damage evolution within this material would be. So what we're going to do is I will find the smallest elements in the model because the characteristic length of the smallest element will help define the initiation of damage. And especially if it's around a hole where you've got um, damage uh, being accumulated around this point. So we're going to probably look at maybe let's say this element because the stress history around that hole will be quite high. So I'm going to switch this to elements and I'm going to select, let's say, maybe this particular one, just as an example. And we're going to say, okay, re replace the selected. So everything's left there and then we can then maximize it. So we've got a, a structure here. So I just need to find the dimensions of this, the length and the width, the approximate length and width. So the distance will come from here to here will be a length and then from here, so there could be a width. So I've got this table where I use in specifying the parameters of the system. So in this particular model, we're going to work with a fracture strain of 0 0.35 and a stress strain axiality of 0.33 and a strain rate of zero. So we need to calculate displacement of failure. So what's the length? So the length we calculated from here on 2.06. So I'll copy that and I'll paste it here. And the width, is 1.817 so and obviously because it's a 2 d system the height we can make it at zero so that when we calculate the volume or it will be the length so the volume here will be the length times width times height and the characteristic length will be the cube root of this volume and that gives us this length so and then finally displacement of failure will be this um, characteristic length times the fracture length of the material and we get it at 0.482 so we can then say okay if we go back to our material so under material steel so we can then think about what we want under ductile damage so we've already specified that our fracture strain is 0 0.31 our stress drag is 0 0.33 the strain ratio is that so we then need to find what damage evolution so we're using a displacement damage evolution and displacement of failure we think is 0.48 and I've just shown you how you can get that. If you're interested in more detail about the relevance and how these numbers are derived and what is the whole theory behind it, look at this video where I make to show extensively doctor damage, the principles behind it, and it makes a holistic sense. And I believe you'll find it helpful. Then the next thing we need to do is to create a section. So we'll call this our steel section and it will be associated with our steel. And then we can do a section assignment by selecting this and then assigning it to the properties. So there are a few other things we then need to walk through. So if you look at our instances, so the instance of this material is this, and we can then provide some, some sets. So I'm going to call this X back edge. So which is this one, so we identify the X back, and then this will be Y base, and this will be here. So we can also look at X front. So just to create the re relevant sets that you need at the front, and then we need to also introduce a reference node that we're going to use to apply our loads. So if I press and hold here, I'll select this offset, create the zoom point from an offset. So I'll select there. So it asks me what is the offset. It's along the x-axis, so I'm just going to make it a 10. So I've got an offset there. So I can then create a reference point based on that offset point and also similarly create a reference point set associated with that reference okay so we've got all that specified so we'll create our step so our step here so i'm going to call it load load here or loading here step so we're going to use a dynamic explicit analysis to check what we are doing and we we'll leave the defaults there so that i can then go ahead and create my reference point history output and this will be associated with the set that we've specified, which is a reference point. And I'm going to track only the reaction force in the one direction and displacement in one direction. So basically, since this, I'm going to apply a load in the one direction. Okay, so we've got that. So we can then go and look at boundary conditions. So basically, X back ruler. 
So we're going to make it an initial boundary condition, displacement based, and we already specified our x back edge, which I can highlight as that. So we constrain it only in the one direction. So we'll do the same y base roller. So this will be based on the y base, and we'll constrain it in the two directions so that we have one quarter of a quadrant as our analysis. So because this is a resentful element we are working with. So the next thing is to apply our extensile load. So it's going to be associated with a loading step, and we're going to attach it to the point load. The system is 100, so if I apply 15 minutes, 15% 15 load, so that means I'm going to apply a load there. And because we're doing an explicit, we need to create a table, so amplitude curve. And I need to specify some numbers. So again, this is our amplitude function that we're going to use. So I'll just need to paste it in there. And it's fine so i can find it here amplitude curve associated with that loading step so it's fine so basically we've got our load applied at this point but we need to be able to make a connection with it to the face we want to load which is the front and that's where the constraint equation comes in so this will become our x x equation so let's call it x equation it will be attached to equation a kinematic equation so coefficient one we're looking at the x front displaced in the one direction with respect to the reference point minus one again if you're interested in understanding how this comes about i've made a video which you can see here that can show you more details about the principle around using a constraint equation to apply load on the model so what we've done here is that we're applying our load here and it's been kinematically linked to that front the reason why i want i do this is that i want to track only the history of this point so that my simulation at the end will be cleaner. I'll have a, a few set of data to track in my history variable, and then it makes everything more efficient in analysis. So it's a more elegant way than applying directly the load of the sample. And we can then go and create a job. Okay, so the job has finished running, so we can look at the results. Okay, so we've got an excellent setup of a model. So if we look at the analysis, we can then see what's going on here. So the system starts moving and then once it starts forming cracks, the cracks form and forms across the system and then runs all the way to the end. And then you have a really nice fracture. So if we look at the plastic strain in that one direction, which is the direction of loading, and then we can track it more gradually to see what is happening. So right at the start, you see a buildup of stress in the system. So you've got this 45 degree usually um, buildup of stress through the material. And then there's also this angle that is forming. There are all these areas of weakness all being initiated by the presence of the voids, which becomes stress intensity. So what we're looking at here is a plastic strain. So we are getting close to the yield stress of the material. So some of the green ones here, if you look at the numbers, about 2 to 229, and the yield stress is 250. So we're getting very close to the point when the system is about to yield, and then you can move on a bit, move on a bit, move on a bit. So now some elements are yielded. So they have now meeting the failure criteria, the doctor damage criteria required for the system. So you can see them meeting that criteria here. So for example, the ones are in five are 420. So it's really in that failure regime, it's going beyond failure and it's now in the strain hardening zone. And then all of a sudden now the failure criteria kicks in. So if you look very closely around here, you can see already one of the element, the first element to fail. And like we anticipated, it will be an element that is very much in the circle, one of the smaller elements there. So that once it meets the failure criteria, you see it right in that region where stress intensity is supposedly high. And then if we keep moving on a bit, so you can see there's a build up more and more of this fail and these two voids begin to coalesce, almost beginning to coalesce. And then because these regions are weaker, it's going to translate to other regions in the model. And then you can keep going. And inst instead of the system carrying on this way, it begins to diverge because this again becomes a region of more vulnerability in the model. And then ultimately, as they form, they begin to fracture and ultimately there's effective fracture of the material and then it's not able to bear load anymore. So we can also look at the shear history in the system and the same kind of thing will hold. So because again, shear would propagate. So you can see there's a buildup of shear, negative shear, positive shear in those regions causing the system again, this region of vulnerability forms 
and you carry on as well until you get eventual damage in the system. So we can keep looking around and just visualize what's happening in terms of the contour plots. But what would really be interesting is what about the history variable, the force displacement profile. So we'll go on here. So we'll basically click here and look at the history variable. We've already asked it to track setting history, which is the reaction force and the displacement. So the reaction force and the displacement, we can plot that. So we get a really nice plot of reaction force and displacement, which we can basically come here and then rename this and call it RF1. And then the next one there, I'm going to call U1. So we can then go back here and then operate on that. So if we operate on this and then continue, so we're going to use the combined function, displacement divided by 100, we know. This is the length of that cross section. And then our reaction force will be divided by again 100, which is times one, which is the cross sectional area in that direction. And then we'll plot the expression. And then we can see it gives us some really nice value. So you can see what's happening. The material was able to get to somewhere around 350 megapascal. And then there's a bit of a dual, and then this kind of happens. So this whole post yield behavior is really driven by what is going on within the material. So of course, we can go ahead and change this to stress and strain. So what we see here is how you can uh, do a doctoral damage analysis of a represented volume element of a steel material where you are using a Dirichlet boundary condition and explicit analysis methods. If you want to go into much detail to understand about the damage, then this is an extensive video that I made that shows a whole lot about damage of a steel material. If you're interested in this kind of videos, please do subscribe so that when contents like this are made, you'll be the first to see it.